Hey, everyone. Welcome to the New Stack Makers. I'm Alex Williams. Today, we are discussing Teleport 9, in particular, Teleport Machine ID. And my guest today is Ben Arendt, who is a developer relations manager at Teleport. Ben, great to have you here. Thanks for having me. So before we get started, I always love to talk with the people who are interviewing about themselves. And I saw that you uh, have an interesting background, but I was curious, first of all, about, you know, where did you grow up? Where, what, what really influenced you kind of in your younger years to be kind of where you are today? Can you think of anything in particular? Yeah, well, I uh, grew up on the south of England, um, currently in Oakland. And, you know, growing up, big thing that influenced me was, you know, like early kind of like internet, you know, I was probably the era of the 56K modem. Um, yeah, the UK was always a bit, a little bit delayed. Um, and I actually remember going to like a career advisor at the time being like, Hmm, isn't it kind of interesting with careers with computers? And they're like, you know, that's not going to be a thing. You know, you could <laughs> maybe be a professional programmer, you know, Microsoft was like in the it world. Um, but I think the whole concept of that initial web, and then we saw like web two and all of the web three things is that sort of new emergence of like youth coming up. Um, and so basically just like the power and the ability to connect to people over the internet um, locally was always an incredible thing that I think the internet really opened up and now everyone can like experience it. Excellent. And so you did go into industrial design as your focus of study, as I yeah. saw on your LinkedIn. Why did you decide on industrial design and how did that lead to being at a place like Teleport today? I mean, I love making things and taking things apart, which is a natural part of my curiosity. Um, and I think a thing that's sort of interesting now, we talk a lot about um, the S-bomb. And as I went through my yeah. like, industrial design process, you you know, design something, you mainly get it made in China, you get it shipped, but you have like a bit of materials. And I think the thing that sort of really got me excited about, our, traditionally it was like interaction design. So it was like the interface between mm -hmm. hardware and software. And... Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is even like pre-iPad. And so like to people who made computers, the industrial design is like kind of interesting, but it's not as interesting as the software. And I think it's right. sort of be like hardware has disappeared. Making software is one way easier than having to do with like an uh, actual bit of materials in China. Like if you ship a million widgets that are wrong, like you've got a million widgets. But if you can like easily iterate with software, and I think that's the exciting thing about the movement of, you know, SaaS, mm -hmm. And you can just always redeploy. You can give people different variants of your products, which is sort of hard to really do in like the physical world. And I think that kind of really excited me about, um, you know, the move into software and startups. And I moved to the Bay Area a decade ago for a real estate startup. Okay. And, um, you know, we talk about like bootstrapping. I stepped under my desk for the first six months <laughs> until we had like ramen profitability. Okay. It took me like a year or so to realize that like most startups don't necessarily are that scrappy. <laughs> and um, the real estate startup didn't go anywhere and we got into the developer tool space and so I've worked on except, exception trackers uh, NoSQL databases as a provider and I always say to people in the Bay Area it's like the gold rush you know it's always better to sell pickaxes and jeans yeah. than it is to be looking for the next big hit yeah no kidding isn't that true uh, so now you're at Teleport and you must have learned a lot along the way about the complexity of those you know, interactions in between the software and the hardware and really that delineation between hardware engineers and software engineers and the delineation between security teams and developer teams. And a lot of what I see from you all doing at Teleport is trying to decrease that complexity. So could you tell us a little bit about Teleport itself, what is the company, what does it do, and how does it help with that complexity that often comes when you're thinking about security integrating into that software bill of materials, which uh, you refer to as SBOM? Yeah, I think if you go back a bit, historically, you know, if you wanted to have your infrastructure, you would build out like a rack <clears throat> and you would be in charge of like the physical security. You know, if someone wanted to like reboot it, they could physically go up to it. I think the movement to cloud, we've kind of moved to this shared responsibility model. We assume that the physical access to the rack 
is secured up to a certain level, and then you're responsible for everything above it. So, you know, in Amazon, it's the VPCs, it's the IAM, it's everything else, all of this extra complexity. And what Teleport does is it helps teams provide uh, easy, secure access to all of this infrastructure. And we started off in the world of um, servers and SSH access. But in the last couple of years, we sort of covered the full gamut of things you would access everywhere from you know, servers, Kubernetes clusters, to even um, AWS management console. And the thing that makes sort of Teleport unique is one of the core ideas is short-lived credentials. So everything is sort of based upon certificates in the background. You don't really see it as a user. But if you were to, uh, each day you log in, you get a certificate for that day, which is defined as some sort of role. And you can go about your day's access. Once those eight hours have passed, your credentials are invalid, and you need to go back through uh, SSO flow to log in again. And this sort of fixes many problems that um, you traditionally had with you know, just infrastructure in general, like team members get onboarded, they come and go. You might have to add like public keys to servers, you know, Ansible run. And it just, the complexity just increases, increases as you have more stuff in your um, applications. And so, you know, as we've added database support, we've added more users sort of accessing different services in a sort of a secure manner. So one of the things I was recognizing when I was reading uh, about, you know, the background on, on these different capabilities you have, you started with, you know, uh, you know, with uh, uh, SSH nodes, for instance, you cover Kubernetes clusters, and there's a lot of discussions on, there's a lot of things in there about configurations themselves. That's one of the concerns that a lot of people have about Kubernetes is that, you know, is the multiple users might be asking, a, uh, accessing a YAML file, or you might have uh, uh, multiple personas, um, you know, uh, do, you know, working on a configuration, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I think common case is if you, you know, create a fresh Kubernetes cluster, you might add everyone to a uh, like system masters role, which is sort of the default sort of God mode. And what happens is teams might pass around like a cube, like a long lived cube config to the whole team. And so one problem is like there's no visibility into which users are using that um, sort of cube config. What are they doing when they sort of access the Kubernetes API? And two, like if that person leaves, like are you really rotating that cube config? Which the most likely answer is probably not. Um, right, right. Right. So, so how are you kind of building on that reduced complexity in in Teleport uh, nine? And I'm, you know, and you're making a big deal of the Teleport machine ID preview. So I'm curious on what that is. But first of all, just kind of that 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 complexity issue that you're trying to work on all the time. Well, I think it's starting with the principle of least privilege, um, which is you know a common term of. You only give people the permissions that they need, and then if they need more, you sort of give them on demand. And this generally reduces sort of the attack vector. So if someone wants to get someone's credentials, there's not going to be a like a wider privilege escalation into something else. And I think this is a problem with both like AWS Management Console and Kubernetes clusters. If you have the systems masters rule, it's pretty much easy to get access to any pod. And once you get access to any pod, you can likely get uh, like pop environmental credentials for databases and then you pop the database then you get all that information and you know like uh, bad things can happen in teleport 9 we've taken the same concept for user access but applied it to sort of computers and services that access those clusters i think a classic example for us is um, both ci cd servers and sort of ansible runs you you can think of them almost in the same way so like Let's say Jenkins is, you know, he's like a funny waiter. This is like mascot. But what you do is the ops team will set up Jenkins. They'll give, you know, Jenkins like a very long certificate, probably a public private key. Once that's configured, you know, you may rotate it once a year. You may not. But Jenkins just goes about his business. And um, there's many sort of problems here. And we're seeing this a lot more with... Um, you know, both SolarWinds attack, which was uh, compromised of the build infrastructure. And so people know that these like build infrastructures, they'd not only run your like tests, but often if they're doing continuous deployment, they might have specific credentials that get access to your AWS 
account. And then if you have a privileged credential in an AWS account, it's pretty easy to then like escalate to something else. And what machine ID does is it provides the same access of short-lived certificates, but for these machine-to-machine um, -machine communication. Hmm. So let's go through Teleport 9.0 and how it reflects about you know, Teleport itself and its mission and how you're trying to help users with these issues that you're talking about. What is Teleport M Machine ID pre and what is the preview? So the preview is our first release of um, Machine ID. And so this lets teammates, lets, this lets Teleport customers enroll robots into their clusters. So instead of using sort of, you know, the Jenkins example, public private keys, you set up Tbot, which is another service that you run. And sort of Tbot, once it's issued, it will automatically retrieve new certificates every 20 minutes. This is also customizable. And what this does is by issuing these short-lived credentials for access, if there is a compromise on your machine, you can easily lock those credentials. And the other benefit is there's a full audit log of what's happening during those runs. So if you notice that it was um, like Ansible, the way in which Ansible runs, for example, it like SCPs a file into the host and then it runs that file. We get all this, this information in Teleport to know, oh, what are these machines doing um, and how are they accessing it? Okay, so it gives you more of a window into, in, in, into that, doesn't it? Yeah, it, like one, it reduces like the human error. So um, often you might have like a person which would run the like public private keys on some machine, you know, like accessing and securely rotating those credentials can be difficult or it might be on disk somewhere. It reduces that problem. Once the T-Bot service is joined, it's only a one-time token. Even if you were to try to get those certificates, we have certain mechanisms in place to secure those tokens. And um, the second thing is, if they are compromised, because it's such a short window of access, it means that you know they're sort of useless in that sort of short time period, um, greatly reducing privilege escalation. One of the questions I have is about the database features that you're adding to Teleport 9. And you offer lots of capabilities with databases now. And there's multiple databases that you now support. And you know there's a lot of things that I think I'm hearing from what you're talking about in the previous discussions that apply here to databases, what can you say about you know the changes that you that people will see in Teleport Nine? Yeah, database is an interesting addition to Teleport. You know, it's sort of many of the crown jewels of your applications are in databases. You know, you can might pop a server, you has have you know like some service or program, but there's not much sensitive information in here. Databases are likely to have like PII, and so if you're in a HIPAA or you have like PCI or you're going through SOC 2, you want to make sure that people are, at, you know, who's accessing your databases and what are they doing. And so Teleport 9 just extends our features that we have in place for um, MariaDB, Redis, and Microsoft SQL Server, both uh, AWS hosted RDS editions and then also self hosted versions. Um, you know, my favorite one is Redis. I used to run a Redis as a service product. And our product would we would provide people with long passwords, so username and passwords for accessing their cluster, and m all the time people would check them into GitHub, and so <laughs> they wouldn't put them in an ENV file or they check their ENV file. Maybe not anything that bad will happen if you access a Redis server, but you'll be surprised with um, what can get infiltrated into these servers. And two, you don't want people accessing your machines. Mm -hmm. And even if they did access, you wouldn't necessarily have the visibility into knowing exactly what people did once they connected to that database. So even if someone does get uh, teleport credentials, the teleport proxy is sort of in place that keeps a full order log of the activity and actions of that user um, during that session. And so with uh, that new database access, what is it? what are the, some of the problems that you're seeing out there that this helps uh, resolve? It's the same problem of, you know, as team members come and go, um, you provide access to the database. So likely you'll have like a shared user. So um, let's say the data science team might all use one shared login and they might have one dedicated password. 
um, you know, the best practice in AWS is you set up like a bastion host. You need to configure that to get, you know, get into your VPC because you don't want your database in like a public subnet. That's all extra work that you need to do. And Teleport sort of solves that for you sort of out of the box um, to provide that sort of bastion access to your database. And then if you're, you know, your data science team's all using one shared login, Teleport will like, be able to identify which person in the data science team was accessing which database. Um, and so you can sort of know like what's happening um, at the database level. So you know where the access is, you know, what, what the access is to the database. Yeah. Cool. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask about were these moderated sessions for servers and Kubernetes access. Can you talk to that? Yeah, this is, um, you know, interesting addition that we've had through talking to our customers. And, um, you know, I started off with the two party rule. And this is sort of a concept that you see in um, both accounting and in a more extreme version is like the American nuclear missile silos, you know, you require actually you have the full party system. And this is a system in which you need an observer to witness the actions that are taking place to sort of either approve that someone can start a session, and this is both for SSH and Kubernetes, and also the option to provide them the ability to terminate their session, for example. And moderated sessions is highly configurable. You know, you could add as many people as you like, but an example, you might want to request like three people, another developer, and maybe someone from the compliance team to make sure whatever's happening during that session on a Kubernetes cluster on a server is fully observable. Um, and it also provides all of the other controls. So if the auditor didn't like what was happening, they have the ability to terminate the session of the individual who'd stop. Excellent. Any concluding thoughts about Teleport 9 that you'd like to talk about? I think the last one is we've really finished up our support for Windows desktop access. This was added in Teleport 8. But in Teleport 9, we have um, clipboard supports. And we have the ability to record the sessions. So we have full session playback, um, which I can add in the demo. They'll be on YouTube. Great. Yeah, so we're going to do a demo now. So we'll go over to that. For anyone who is listening to this podcast, the demo is available on the new, the new Stack uh, YouTube channel. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start that right now. But Ben, I... Thanks for your time here, and we'll, we'll carry on with the demo. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.